Well, we are here to talk about the future of work and AI, but there's a thing we haven't talked about yet, although it's out there in the lobby. Don't go now to look at it, but there is a robot out there, and we haven't talked about robots yet. So let's talk a little bit about robots, because robots are the physical embodiment of AI. And even though the fields sometimes diverge and come back together, they're very much together now, and now it really is a matter of discussion as to what these robots powered by AI are going to do. And if we look at the history of robotics, it used to be that robotics initially was about the three Ds, dirty, dull, and dangerous tasks. Well, that's really not what robots are all about today. We're creating robots that can do anything that we can imagine. So these robots are going to do all kinds of work. But if they're doing that, then what are people doing? And this is what a lot of us are concerned about worldwide. So we can imagine different futures. We can imagine different parts of society having different futures with robots doing all kinds of work. Um, I'm fond of the WALL-E image of the future in which you, know, you just get to rest, look at your screen, never interact with another human, grow extremely large, um, and probably die at about the age of 30 because that's your life expectancy with that level of uh, sedentary, leisurely lifestyle. Um, and then, of course, that's the haves and what happens to the have-nots in that kind of a scenario. So there is a lot of justified concern about the future of work. Um, and what I want to get us to think about is another reason why we cannot give up work. Um, and it was said earlier today that people need work for a sense of structure. I would like us to push a little bit further and really realize that the science out there for many years has told us that we profoundly, as human beings, need work in order to have a sense of purpose. So we're fundamentally social animals. We need to be doing things physically in the world and we need to be interacting with each other. When we're doing those two things, we live a long time and we tend to be healthier. That's what the data show. When we don't do one of those or either of those things, we tend to live less healthily and less long. So we need social connectedness and some kind of physical purpose in the world in order to be and to do and to thrive. Interestingly, Today, at least, most technologies that are being developed are pushing in the other direction. They're taking away the physical work, any kind of need to be, and they're also kind of taking us away from each other face to face. They're putting us through a screen interaction more than a face to face interaction. And there's a lot of discussion as to what that is doing, not only to society, but to our mental health. So, without being all doom and gloom, there are too many people today who don't have that ability to work and don't have a sense of purpose and don't have a living wage as a result, and there are a lot of issues as for the society at large. And what's really scary about this is that these numbers are all increasing. So I could tell you that we have 800,000 new strokes per year right now, and that number is going to double in the next 10 years, that people used to have strokes in their 60s, now they get them in their 40s. I could tell you that one in um, 50 children is diagnosed with autism in this country, um, and that's quadrupled in the last 20 years. There are any number of statistics like that. Um, and that's really a domain where we can say, well, that's really depressing, or we can say, well, there's some great challenges in there. What does that have to do with AI? What does that have to do with robotics? Well, this is what I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you about this field of socially assistive robotics. And it's a very counterintuitive notion of robotics. Because again, when you think about robots, you think about machines that do work, physical work. Well, what if I told you that there is a future in which we will have physical machines, robots, embodiments of AI, doing work that helps us without doing anything physical, but literally helping us do our own work. And that is a combination of monitoring, coaching, motivating, and companionship. And so we're all aware of this idea of the quantified self, right? We're going to have a lot of data about ourselves and others in the world, and that's going to influence our behavior. Unfortunately, in the realm of human health, uh, the quantified self has not proven itself to be very effective. It's a very simple reason. Uh, just because you know that you should be doing something doesn't mean that you'll do it. Just because you know that you shouldn't have had that dessert at lunch, ah, you still did. I had two. So um, we know that behavior change is incredibly hard. We need to kind of get our own way, get out of our own way. It's very difficult to understand the factors that drive human behavior. Um, and often, technologists don't really take into account those fundamental factors, and those factors as I said, had to do with social connectedness and physical being in the world. So un unintuitively, but over the last 15 years, we have increasing evidence to show that when you interact with another physically embodied agent, whether it's a friend, a family member, a pet, or a robot, 
you are actually much more influenced to change your behavior than when you're interacting with the screen. So that is the foundation of this field of socially assisted robotics. Machines that help you do your own work. So again, you can say, well, why, why do I have to do this with a robot? Why can't I have my smartphone, my smart watch, my smart glasses, whatever the next device is, um, to get me to do what I need to do? And the reason is simply because how we're wired. So if we look at how the human brain works, when we are interacting with another physically co-present agent, like I am here with all of you, I can barely see you from the lights, but I know you're there. So that's very different than if I were talking to a video of all of you. It's very different to my brain. And the same for you. Because I am here in the room with you, your brain is actually behaving differently than it would if you were watching me on the screen. Both in terms of how much activation and how dispersed it is around your brain. This is very important because as a result, we're more influenced, we learn better, and we retain knowledge and information and experiences more from physically embodied interactions. So that's why it has to be robots and not just screens. So, let me give you an example of that. Rehabilitation, recovery, learning, retraining is hard. It's lonely. It's depressing having to do things when you've lost function, when you're not at your best. People stare at you, you're terrible, you drop things, it's stigmatizing. This is why recovery is hard, not because people are lazy or don't do what they should. So how can we encourage people to help themselves? Who is going Seriously, to be there? You can do better than that. So we need someone or something that cares that has the right level of being interesting, being funny, but not being trite, not being too repetitive, yet not being completely unpredictable. Um, the perfect companion and an homage to Rocky at the same time. So here's an activity of daily life that you might need to do if you have a motor dysfunction. Um, it takes hours per day of depressing activities of daily life. Why would you do it? Because there's someone there who cares, who is watching over you, and who is there to give you positive feedback through a social contract. And that's really what social assistive robotics is about. It's creating that agent who is there for every person to help them help themselves. So over the last 15 years, that's what we've done. Uh, we've put our robots to work by putting people to work in various contexts. And we were inspired by where the need is the highest, cardiac disease, one in two adults, has cardiac disease in this country, autism, I already told you, one in 50 and continuing to rise. Um, developmental delays are one in six. I mean, the numbers are just staggering. So we have experimented in these different domains. Um, and I just want to summarize a little bit for you. Um, so in particular, the aging domain. Um, in robotics in particular, people think of the elderly as the killer app. Um, there are different ways to interpret that, but the general idea, <laughs> what we mean by that is that you know, there is a domain where robots will really come and help. You know, they're, they're going to do work for the elderly so the elderly can continu continue to stay in their homes. It turns out though that if you take all of that physical work away from an elderly person, again, their purpose goes away. So as I often tell my friends, collaborators, and at this point, even business partners, it's great if you have a room of vacuum cleaner, but if you don't want to get out of bed, even to vacuum your floor, then you don't have the drive to really live and be and thrive. Now, you may not have to do a vacu vacuuming, that's fine, but you have to have some purpose. So, it is very lonely and demoralizing, even to age in place, and especially to age with a disability. Most people do age into a disability. Right now, we live 10 years longer than we used to, but those 10 years are not really healthy. So, it's not a, you're getting more, but maybe it's not what you want. Um, and typically, what helps us, again, to thrive, to have a purpose, is that someone cares. But how can everyone have someone that cares? Similarly, on the younger part of the age spectrum, um, there are, there's, so developmental disabilities are on the rise. Autism is just one example. Anxiety in young people is extremely pervasive. It's extremely sad, for example, that a very large percentage of college students are now depressed and have anxiety issues. I mean, college, that's supposed to be the fun time, right? Um, so there are a lot of pervasive problems, lifelong, on the younger and um, older part of the spectrum. Um, and one of the sort of sad parts of, in particular, young people with special needs is because they don't have social contact, because other kids won't play with them, they don't get to practice. And therefore, they sort of unfairly don't get to be as good at something. 
Um, so interestingly, we can put the robot in the loop here, and we can have the robot serve as a training tool for the child to practice whatever these skills are, whether it's social interaction for kids with autism, whether it's emotion management for kids with anxiety, um, and then bring other kids to play with them, because in many ways the robot is a social catalyst. Kids love to play with robots, and therefore they play with other kids who play with robots. Um, so sometimes you find the robot to be the least selfish and most interesting thing in the room. So this may sound like a pipe dream to you, but actually this has been going on for about 10 to 15 years, and in various labs there has been a great deal of validation. We know that people across the age and ability spectrum, from children to the elderly, from healthy adults to individuals with advanced Alzheimer's, respond very favorably to machines, statistically significantly, you know, they hug the robots, they smile at them, they interact with them for extended periods of time, stress levels are reduced in measurable ways, skills that are learned, behavior is changed. So there's already evidence now, scientific evidence, not just anecdotal evidence, that this really does work. But it's not easy. So it really would be a lot easier if we could just do it on the screen, but again, you need that brain engagement. Why is it not easy? What is so hard about robotics? We, those of us who teach robotics, and there are several of us in the room, uh, we often get these eager undergraduates and they say, well, how hard can it be? And then they discover how, just how hard it can be. Um, the fundamental difficulty is that, you know, there's this uncertainty. Robots are still not incredibly smart. Having a body is very complex. It's not just about safety, right? Of course we don't want our machines to hurt people. But it's much more subtle than that. How I orient my body, how close I get to you, how much I gesticulate, how loudly I speak. These are all social factors that will determine how well you accept me and like me and how long you want to interact with me. When robots get this wrong, we don't like them particularly. Then we get social dynamics. We want our machines to influence people in positive ways without being too pushy. Personality plays a large role in this. We once did an experiment in which we matched robot personalities to user personalities. This was stroke patients. Um, or mismatch them. And we found that when a user is matched with a robot that has a similar personality on the extroversion introversion spectrum, people did more exercises and they liked it better. So what, is, what does it mean for a robot to have a personality? What does it mean for a robot to have a backstory? Um, there are all kinds of interesting issues with social dynamics that we have to deal with. Um, and then probably the ultimate challenge, the one that gets talked about a lot, is of course machine learning. So how do we get these interactions to last a long time? We need our social relationships with people and with machines to be generative, to keep changing, to be interesting. We want to relax, we want it to be dependable and reliable and safe, yet we don't want it to be boring. We want it to be repetitive, but not too much. We want it to be trust, but also surprise. That's hard. And I would argue that we don't have yet any machine learning models that can really do this. So we have amazing deep learning approaches that are great at doing some things extremely well, which are extremely narrow. Um, human socializa socialization and interaction and staying together is just the opposite of that. What goals are you optimizing? There's so much going on. You want to be engaged, you don't want to be bored, you want to trust, there's so much going on. And to me, that's really the ultimate challenge of AI. It's coming up with these platforms that will really empower us as people. So not taking our work away, not making us fat and lazy and poor and scared and whatever it may be, um, but just the opposite, empowering us to be our best selves. Thank you. <laughs>